The film begins with a montage of suitcases being packed while, in the background, a song talks about embarking on a great adventure, feeling love, and enjoying youth. It was time to make a memory. Afterward, the scene changes to Will, a teenager, running from the police. The boy is unsuccessful. Irritated, the policeman puts him against the wall and handcuffs him, then takes him to the Social Protection Service for Children and Adolescents. One of the agents scolds the teenager for stealing the police car. Worried and anxious, he begins to cite Will's past life, how he had been through several schools and several houses and failed to do well at all. The man is not proud of Will's delinquent posture and tells him that he doesn't have a chance, he will send him to reform school. Will is startled, shaking his head. He promises to be better and begs for one more chance, but is unsuccessful. The social services man apologizes, claiming he has no other option. Upset, the agent says that he went through a lot after his parents died and that he was a good kid, but he needs to find out soon. Will swallows hard, but neither of them says another word because the agent's secretary interrupts him, saying that a woman wants to speak with him. The man gets up, asks Will to wait for him, and leaves the room, leaving a thoughtful and sad Will behind. While waiting, the teenager looks at the photo of his parents and remembers when they were alive. The longing on the young man's face is clear. The agent returns to the room, happier than when he entered, and introduces Kristen to Will, saying that she will take care of him. George, Kristen's son who was accompanying her, is excited and greets Will effusively. Kristen smiles at Will and says that she is looking forward to having him on the summer trip. The hope on the misbehaving teenager's face fades. Find him where? They talk about summer camp, but Will says he isn't the type to go to camps. The agent looks at him and ruefully says it was either that or juvenile hall. Will chooses to go camping. The teenager sits on the couch in disbelief at the decision he's made and starts singing about his life being lived in circles. Kristen joins in the song and talks about the Bible, saying that God saves prisoners. That she had an experience of finding and following God. Soon, all three of them are on a bus filled with young people singing about the joy of following God where no one has gone. This is the great adventure. It's good to prepare yourself, leave sadness behind, discover new horizons, and be alive for the reason you were created. It doesn't take long for them to arrive at the camp. As soon as he gets off the bus, Will looks to the side and sees a beautiful girl dancing too. He gets dumbstruck. The teenager can't hold back and asks her to dance. Once the song is over, he introduces himself and discovers that her name is Avery. The atmosphere was very good until Sean, one of the guys from the camp, showed up talking and showing off. He's not very nice. George finds the three, and Sean asks how they met, but Will lies, saying they were cousins. Afterward, they go back to singing about the great adventure, ignoring Sean. Will turns to George and tells him he didn't know the camp was a church thing. At the office, Kristen meets David, the owner of the camp. She hands him the file on Will Hawkins, and when David looks at the things he's done, he asks if he won't be in trouble. Kristen smirks and jokes that David was a rebellious boy too, so he would be fine. The man asks if Will was in the cabin of truth, and Kristen, with a guilty and a little strange expression, confirms. George shows Will around the cabin, filled with stuffed animals and unusual decor. Will is a little disgusted and doesn't know why George chose that place. As Will surveys the space, George asks what that was about lying about who he was and expresses that he didn't like being included in the lie, as it was against biblical precepts. Will ignores it and only pays attention to Avery entering the cabin with a friend. Then the teen, with a half-smile, says he understands why George chose the cabin. The boy forces an answer from George, who, after hesitating, admits he liked the view, Presley Borsky, Avery's roommate. Taking the hint, Will asks about Avery, but the other boy just laughs, saying that she's way out of his leak. Will doesn't give up. He pressures George about Avery. George says that she liked the camp and stays in the summer as camp counselor. Will smiles. He explains to George that he needed to make the camp work and that he would have to become someone he wasn't meant to be. If George helped him, Will would help him with Presley. George accepts. They go to the activity registration location and find Avery and Presley at the paintball registrations. Will practically forces George to go there, and they start talking to the girls, discussing the teams. Will tries to include George in the conversation, but he's all flustered and starts to get tangled up. Presley isn't much help either, she clearly wants to talk to George but is shy. Avery tries to snap out of the awkwardness of the moment and hands Will the clipboard to sign. They were officially on the paintball team. As the boys walk away, Presley and Avery talk about how Presley likes George, and Will and George talk about the boys' crush. George starts singing about not thinking he's good enough. Presley, still away from him, does the same. Avery and William try to help, while Avery tells her she is perfect as God made her, and Will tries to give her advice on how to behave. When the song ends, Will and George find Sean. The not-so-cool guy promised he would defeat them in the Warrior Games, a camp competition between the members of three teams, Verd Maximus, Crimson Angels, and Azure Apostles. Sean even invites Will to be one of his apostles, but Will says he would never have the nerve to wear the shirts they wear in public. Sean replies that, in fact, he didn't even have a choice. Teams were chosen at a ceremony. In the evening, the ceremony begins. It's the court. In an impersonation of Braveheart, David tells the rookies to stand up. 
One by one, they are selected, and Will goes to Verd Maximus. George greets him with a smile, saying he pulled some strings. One by one, they begin to sing the war hymns. The competition had begun. The next day, David announces on the microphone the beginning of the Warrior Games. George, excited, wakes Will up, saying it's going to be an epic day, but Will counters that he's 17 miles from civilization, and surrounded by Jesus fans. It couldn't be epic. George raises an eyebrow and claims he knows he should be offended but that he was impressed with Will's geographic skills. Did he just know about it? Will sits up in bed, looks into George's eyes, and says his rule number one, always have an exit plan. George says he's not going anywhere because he needs him for the talent show and that Will has him. He also tells him to stop his attitude, enjoy his time at camp, and win the competition. In the cafeteria, the two of them discuss the state of the food when Sean pulls a chair up to the table and yells five minutes. Will is at a loss, not knowing what this means, but Sean beckons him to sit in the posted chair. Even without being aware of what is happening, Will accepts, and Sean explains the rules of the game. Five minutes of fame it's time to find out information about the mysterious rookie. Several questions are asked, about preferred colors in films. Then, they ask for their favorite book of the Bible, and Will stumbles. Lucky for him, he manages to dodge the question by saying that he couldn't choose, they were all his favorites. Other questions are asked, and everyone, apparently, is very fond of him. When leaving the chair, Will calls George to sit down and, when the boy is leaving the cafeteria, David calls him to talk. Will says he didn't do anything, and David tells him to stay calm. The man expounds on his happiness about being with them. Will asks why the name of the camp was Awigawe, and David explains about the week's potential to change lives. Someone is a week away from an experience that will change everything for them. Will smiles and seems to like David. The man takes his leave, shouting about warrior games, and George appears, wryly thanking Will for putting him in the spotlight. Oh, and by the way, the boy says, Sean hated Will. Avery and Presley find the two and praise Will's performance on five minutes, but now things will get serious. The games have begun. Sean comes in screaming, and says that Avery would crush the blob since she loved it. And Will, taking the cue to impress her, says that he loves the blob too. George, knowing that he hates heights, tries to talk him out of it, but Will doesn't give him a chance and lies, saying he was the best. Avery accepts the challenge and says that she will defeat him. George tells them to practice some blob jumping. Will freezes. Some jumps. He didn't know he was going to be in the heights. The two arrive at the lake and Will looks at the height of the platform. Would he have to jump from there? Oh no. The boy climbs onto the platform, scared to death, and the feelings give way to music. He sings of a river at his feet, running across dry land. He's scared, but he wants to dive into that river because it calls to him. It was time to take a leap of faith. And he jumps, landing on the springy surface and hurling George into the lake. The song about the river of living water begins. Young people sing about the power of Jesus. It's time to dive in, to go deep, and be caught in the rush and in the flow. It's time to dodgeball. The competition against the Crimson Angels and the Azure Apostles is fierce, only Presley remains in the group. George is worried about the number of balls that would be thrown at her and runs to defend her. But it does not work as a ball hits her in the face. She needs ice. Avery accompanies her while she treats the wound, and Will tries to get George to talk to the girl. He chickens out. Avery, meanwhile, tries to cheer her friend up. George ends up running to the bathroom, and Will tries to persuade him to talk to Presley. He might not think he was the girl's guy, but he was going to get her. George asks Will to help him, give him a makeover, and Will tries. George starts singing about Presley one day being his. That he would conquer her. When his daydreaming is over, he looks into the mirror wide-eyed. No, he never would. So he runs away and doesn't talk to Presley. Another day dawns at Awigawe camp. David makes the morning announcements, and, by the lake, Will writes a song. Avery arrives, says it was beautiful, but ends up getting embarrassed for interrupting him. Will says it doesn't have a problem, that he was there to see the sunrise and escape George's morning cheer. Avery laughs. She asks if he wrote the music, and Will confirms. She thinks it's impressive that he plays the guitar. Will says he was there to play the guitar, but what was she doing there? Avery sheepishly talks about being kind of personal, but if he wanted to, she could show him. Will accepts. They go to a place a little further away while talking quietly and teasing each other. Avery stops in a beautiful space in the woods, full of flowers and birdsong, with a white bench in the center. She tells the story of the reason for that place. Her father had built the place for her mother to have something magical for her when she wasn't at the hospital. It was her favorite place on the planet. Said, she talks about her mother, about the butterflies she loved. Avery says it's been almost 11 years, but she can still feel that her mother is there. Will asks if being there doesn't hurt, and Avery says yes, she misses it every day, but it's only temporary. She will see her again for sure. She has faith. The girl asks Will if he also believed that, and, stuttering, he lies, agreeing. Avery starts tending to the flowers, and Will blurts out that she was perfect. Avery's smile fades. She didn't like that word. She wasn't perfect. Perfection is impossible. She tries to do everything right but always gets it wrong. She tries to be what others want her to be, and it's exhausting. 
Will tries to explain himself by saying that he just meant that she has it all figured out. Avery, thoughtful, begins to sing. She talks about the wind moving, but she is standing still. She is waiting for her life to be filled, with a hopeful heart and a head full of dreams, but the transformation is hard. She's looking for her place in this world. She has little to lean on and needs God's light to help her. Will joins in singing. Does God hear him even if millions are on their knees? Can he hear him asking where he belongs? He also needs God's light to find his place in the world. The two dance together, connected to each other. The sun is going down, and standing in front of her, Will says that she is perfect. Avery asks where he resides. Will lies and says that he stays in New York with his brother. Avery finds the answer strange since he had said before that he lived in Philadelphia, but there is no time to answer it because soon a siren goes off and Avery, excited, says that he was in trouble. David gets out of the trailer and starts ordering the paintball teams. Everyone, including Will and Avery, is dressed up for the competition, which promises to be exciting and full of adrenaline. George is confident because they have Will. When the competition starts, a song about the father's house plays while showing their recreation time. Paintball, football, eating pie competition and many other activities. Will is having fun in all of them. After all, the father's house has space, lots of food, and everyone is welcome, especially those who want love. The scene goes back to the paintball and Presley steps in front of George as he is about to be shot. Both are eliminated. Avery and Will seek shelter in the same place and make a temporary truce. They decide to work together and kill all the Azores. Unfortunately, in the end, Avery shoots him. The Crimson Angels win. Verd Maximus is in second place, and the Azure Apostles are in third. Sean becomes irritated. They never took third place and were losing to some random guy that is George's cousin. Who was this guy? As the days pass, Will is adjusting to the camp. He plays with George, drinks soda, and acts like George is his brother. Just teenagers being teenagers. They even watch Fairy's Buller Day Off, George's favorite movie. It's bonfire night. Kristen speaks to all of them, saying that she doesn't know them, but God knows them. She's pretty sure he's a fan. George gets up and starts saying that he doesn't know much, but he freezes. To his rescue, Will stands up and completes the sentence. He doesn't know much, but this much he does, seeing George act like Superman to save Presley was pretty cool. When he sits down, George smiles and thanks him. David gets up and says God is up to something good and amazing. Avery, then, quotes Jeremiah 29, 11, about God having a plan and a good future for everyone. She doesn't know much, but this much she does. When words fail, she can only open her mouth to sing about how awesome God is. Everyone joins in the praise, and Will looks on, moved. His thoughts are loud, music oozes in them. No one sees him or believes in him. Avery also talks about always being in pain. But God only knows how everything affects you, how everyone treats you, and how you think, what you are. So is there a kind of love that God only knows? Will then gets up and, with everyone, starts singing about how awesome God is. After the bonfire is over, Will and Avery walk to their respective cabins together. They talk quietly. Avery asks how he's feeling about camp. It can be overwhelming. Will says it's amazing. It's been so long since he felt so connected and part of something bigger. Avery looks at him, delighted, and asks him to wait a few seconds. As she goes to the cottage, Will tries to force himself to tell her the truth. Avery returns with a photo of Presley, George, her, and him. It was a memory. Will's voice breaks. He thanks her. Avery smiles and says she doesn't have a problem. The two say goodbye, and she goes to the cottage, still smiling. Sean watches all the commotion with a dissatisfied expression. Upon arriving at the cottage, Will finds Kristen hanging up George's clothes. He shows them the photo Avery gave him. Kristen walks over and sees the photo of Will's parents. She says that he looked like his father and that his mother was beautiful. Looking into the teen's eyes, she says they would be so proud of him. Will says they would be proud of him for being there. Later, Sean breaks into David's office and takes Will's file. It was time for the truth to be revealed. The next day, George talks to the Verd Maximus team about the talent show. They had to be epic. Unfortunately, Sean interrupts the rehearsal. He says he wants to give Will some pointers. When the two start talking, Sean says he understands that Will can't change who he is. Will asks what he means, and Sean raises an eyebrow. He knew who Will was, Will Hawkins, vandalism, bad behavior, auto theft. He lied, and it was just a fraud. Sean warns that if Will doesn't tell Avery, he will. He says he was just trying to do the right thing. Will looks at him wryly, as if. A little while later, George runs up to Presley and Avery, asking if they've seen Will. The girl said no. George explains that he disappeared after he talked to Sean, but he had no idea what they had talked about. Avery says it was time they found out. Meanwhile, Will goes to the cabin and packs his bags. When Avery asks Sean what happened, Sean spills the beans. The scene cuts to Will running away. He walks down the road, hitchhiking to cars. Avery goes to the cabin to look for Will, but realizes that he has gone and left the photo. Flustered, the girl runs out and asks her father, David, for the car key, not before asking him to trust her and that Will needed her. David gives her the keys, and she heads down the road. Avery screams Will's name when she finds him. When getting out of the car, the girl asks where he is going, she says that she knows everything, that she doesn't care, and that the two of them need to talk. Will ignores it, keeps walking, and says he doesn't want to talk. 
Avery is hurt, so he would just run away. Frustrated, Will says he doesn't have anything like she did. His parents were taken from him. She didn't know anything about him, so she couldn't pretend to care. Avery, grief-stricken, says she was there because she cared. He was loved. Will is irritated. Who was he loved by? God. So where was he when his parents died? Why didn't he take him along? In fact, says Will, God left him there and hasn't been with him since. What kind of God is this? Avery tries to respond, but Will interrupts. He says he was fine. He didn't need her to fix him. The moment they spent together meant nothing. Avery stares at him in disbelief, deeply hurt as tears run down her cheeks. She hands him the photo, tells him he's a terrible liar, gets in her car, and leaves him on the side of the road. He turns to keep walking but is stopped by the lyrics that come out of his mouth, in a painful melody. He spent so long hurting that lying came so naturally. But the truth. He was only hurting him. He needs to turn around. Do this. Because where he belongs is where love is an answer in a sea of questions. He tried to hold up for so long, but now God is holding up for him. Now, something feels like home. Will runs to the camp. He needs this. He needs his friend's help. His family. His love for him. Avery. He needed God. The talent show begins, and the teams perform. The apostles were in the lead. Worried about the outcome of the competition and Will. George looks for Avery and asks if she found him. Avery says she doesn't think he would come back. George is sad, but it was time for his team's presentation. Avery moves to the back of the crowd, in no mood to join in the commotion. George walks onto the stage, lost and hurt. Avery is in the background, also lost and hurt. Then, Will stands behind her. He says he lied. The moment he spent at the camp meant everything to him. Avery looks at him with wonder, crying. He thanks her for coming to get him, and she thanks him for coming back. Will rehearses a few words to try to explain himself, but Avery doesn't care. She pulls him in for a kiss. A kiss that both wanted so much. They both smiled afterwards. Avery laughs and says that his fans have been waiting for him and that they will talk later. The Verd Maximus concert begins. Will rushes to help the team. He starts to sing, and George grins at the sight of him. His face a mixture of surprise, happiness, and excitement. Together, they all proclaim the joy of being young under God's creation. This is the best thing ever. Sean is annoyed that Will has shown up, but nothing can dampen the overall happiness. With the presentation, Verd Maximus is in first place. Everyone celebrates. When the day dawns, Will and George play with each other. It was the day to leave. Sean, remorseful, congratulates George and Will on their victory and apologizes to Will. Sean points out that Will wasn't the only one trying to impress people. Will tells him not to worry, they're cool. The two parted with joking promises to destroy each other next year. Will goes towards Avery, who is sitting at one of the tables. She smiles and asks if he's coming back next year. With a smirk, the boy says that if she's going to be there, chances are good. George talks to Presley nervously. He picks up a briefcase and hands over a box. It was the collection of 365 letters he'd written her last year. Presley can't help but kiss his cheek. She says that life moves pretty fast, and if they don't look around once in a while, they'll lose it. George's eyes sparkle. It was his favorite movie, Fairy's Buller Day Off. The two laugh at each other, and George says that one day he will marry her. Presley says that she would marry him first. Timidly, she hands him her number and leaves a nervous George behind. When he meets his mother, George asks Will what will happen. Will says he will figure out his next move. Kristen asks if they are ready to leave. The two boys look at her blankly. How so, go away. Kristen laughs and tells Will that she would like him to stay with the two of them. The teens gasped in shock. They were brothers now. Overjoyed, Will effusively thanks Kristen and hugs her. He has a family now. They sing again. Everything has changed. Each learned something. It's where they want to be. There is nothing better. They'll dance in the light, moving to the beat of the time of their lives. And this is the best thing ever.